All right, I think maybe we can start. I'm just going to introduce uh, kind of a series of talks. Uh, we are the number theory group at UCLA has started. So this is uh, the first talk in an experimental series of talk uh, this quarter. There are going to be three of them. It's called uh, CHAT, which stands, which is a name acronym due to Chiyun. It stands for Career, History, and Thoughts, in which we will invite mathematicians to think, uh, ruminate on work of theirs, some theorems, concepts, points of view that prove to have a major influence on the field. So instead of speakers, uh, as in a typical seminar, talking about their latest theorem, they will instead take a step back and talk about, at times, larger visions that were then incarnated in specific results. Uh, paths to discovery to offer theorem specific specific influences etc so we thought that this is a good time to have this kind of talk in this period of social isolation it will be inspiring for all of us especially for the younger members of the audience so there'll be three quarters uh, there'll be three talks this quarter and ken is the first one the details are all on the ucla seminar web page and we'll, we are going to record these talks and the recordings are, will be available on youtube Okay, so let me introduce our speaker, Ken. So we, ask, uh, we are very happy to have the series inaugurated by Ken Ribbit from uh, UC Berkeley. He needs a little introduction to a mathematical audience. Ken's work since his thesis under John Tate in the 70s has played a key role in developing the rich relationship between uh, modular forms and algebraic. The elegance of his expositions and papers has inspired a generation of number theorists in the area. And on a personal note, I'm, I should say as a graduate student, I was greatly influenced by Ken's work myself. So today, Ken will talk about one of the master ideas that lay, that lay behind his influential work. His title is The Langlands Correspondence and Geometry. Over to you, Ken. Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm, I'm really honored to start, uh, inaugurate a new series. And I'd like to compliment the people who thought of this interesting acronym, CHAT, for this series and say hi to uh, all the people who are listening. I looked at the list of participants and indeed um, many of you are my mathematical friends and thank you very much for um, coming to hear my um, thoughts about career and history. So uh, I decided that I would organize this talk around a, a single mathematical problem that I first heard about around the time when I came to Berkeley, which was in 1978. And I think this problem was told to me as coming from Kajdan and from Mumford, but other people also kind of had the same idea at the same time. And uh, th this is a, a general sort of problem that I decided to uh, limit to a special case, but there are lots of generalizations that uh, you can easily supply. So in, in the special case, there, there are two prime numbers, uh, P and Q, they're distinct primes, and, and that's the only uh, requirement on them. So I gave 43 and 47 as uh, examples of distinct primes, just because their product happens to be kind of relevant at the moment. But um, one thing that you might want to do is you might want to think of one of the primes is very small um, or even both of the primes is very small so that the contribution from old forms of level PQ is not too complicated to work out. Um, and in the story, there are two abelian varieties. So first of all, there's the Jacobian of the modular curve X0 of n, where n is the product pq, so that's called j0 pq. And on the other hand, you can take a Shimura curve that corresponds to the quaternion algebra over q, whose discriminant is pq. And using this uh, quaternion algebra, you can make a uh, Fuchsian group that operates on the upper half plane. This is a definite quaternion algebra, so the thing is embedded in uh, GL2R, you take the norm one units in the maximal order, you get something in SL2R, and you can make the quotient, which is the uh, first example that people know of Shimura curves. And if you have some notation where the discriminant of the quaternion algebra is a superscript and the level 
is in parentheses, then the original abelian variety is maybe J01PQ. I won't write the one. And then when you take the Jacobian of the Shimura curve, you get J0PQ of one. And the problem that was posed by Kajdan and Mumford and others is that there's a relationship between the automorphic representations for the two groups in question. So, you know, this is because the algebras are inner forms of each other and um, the HECA operators that act on the spaces of automorphic forms have traces that are related to each other by the um, Selberg trace formula because uh, the traces are calculated by local data, which can match up. And um, because of this matching, which is completely analytic, you can infer from standard conjectures, some of which are now theorems, that there should be a geometric relation between these two abelian varieties. And the relation which is uh, expanded on in the next couple of slides is that the Jacobian of the Shimura curve should be isogenous to a chunk of the abelian variety J0PQ and the chunk is, is the new part. So the new part means the part of the Jacobian that does not pertain to smaller levels. Smaller level in this case means level P or level Q because level one doesn't contribute anything. And my next slide is uh, really brilliantly devised. It's completely blank. And what I've done is I've inserted a lot of blank slides in here so that I have a space to draw, to doodle if necessary. So what I was saying is that uh, analytically for various functorial operations, for example, you can take the tangent space at the identity and take the dual of that. Um, you get spaces of holomorphic uh, modular forms, cusp forms in the two cases. And these spaces both have HECA operators, T sub n, that act for integers n greater than or equal to one. And as far as I know, the originator of the subject is Shimuzu, who published a paper in these Annals of Mathematics, where he pointed out an amazing relation between the traces of the HECA operators on the two spaces. And this amazing relation is that if you restrict to the new subspace of the cusp forms at, uh, for gamma zero PQ, you get the same trace for every N as what you get by looking at the forms on the Shimura side. The Shimura curve, by the way, has no cusps whatsoever. So the modular forms, uh, holomorphic modular forms are automatically cusp forms. And um, if you throw in the eichler shimura relation that expresses the zeta functions of these two abelian varieties in terms of uh, Mellon transforms of modular forms, you see that you know, the um, new part of J0PQ and the shimura jacobian have exactly the same uh, zeta function. They have L-adic representations that are isomorphic for each L. And um, the Tate conjecture relating uh, Galois and the morphisms of Tate modules and actual endomorphisms of abelian varieties, this conjecture, which was later proved by faultings, implies that there should actually be some map, some non-zero homomorphism, in fact, an isogeny between the Shimura Jacobian and the new part of the classical Jacobian, um, and, and this should be even compatible with the HEC operators. So this is kind of an, an amazing thing that was first uh, told to me by various people. I should also mention the name of Andrew Ogg, who was aware of this problem. And uh, he was you know, the first person I talked to when I arrived in Berkeley. And I uh, looked up the review in Math Reviews and Math SciNet for Shimizu's article when I was thinking about this talk. And the review is written by Eichler, who's great. 
And um, Eichler just, uh, you know, describes this as a completely remarkable discovery of Shimizu. And um, nowadays, everyone says, you know, Langland's correspondence, it's just kind of automatic to see this relationship. But imagine at the time in the 60s, when this was first discovered, it was, you know, a complete knockout and um, really impressed um, all the mathematicians of the time. So um, I kind of asked myself whether or not I could prove that the isogeny existed. And it turned out that um, I was able to do this. Um, and the basic reason, you know, if you try to summarize this in a few words, is that I'd written a thesis uh, under Tate's direction, 1973. Um, I also consulted with Jean-Pierre Serre, who helped me think about this problem when I met him in Antwerp in 1972. And basically what I was trying to do is to prove the Tate conjecture for endomorphisms of abelian varieties that have extra um, totally real fields operating on them. So now um, I call these uh, abelian varieties of GL2 type. The um, moniker seems to have uh, stuck. Some people refer to this. And um, you can even treat products of abelian varieties like this, which you still call a GL2 type, just like abelian varieties with complex multiplication can be products of simple things, each of which have a CM field operating on them. And um, in my thesis, I figured out how to prove the re conjectured relation between endomorphisms and Galois equivariant uh, endomorphisms of the Tate module using the techniques that I learned from Sarah's papers, um, you know, especially his book that was published in 1968 on abelian varieties, um, abelian allotic representations and elliptic curves, and also his article in 1972 on points of finite order of elliptic curves, um, where he proved that Galois has big image and the, the basic thing that I wanna stress here is that in the book, Sarah was able to prove um, what he called the isogeny conjecture that elliptic curves with the same zeta function are isogenous as expected under some hypothesis of uh, bad reduction, not everywhere good reduction, J invariant being not an algebraic integer. And then that hypothesis got removed in his article in 1972. But um, if you go back to that hypothesis and you say, you know, when there's bad reduction, potential multiplicative reduction, you can do a lot more than you can do without that hypothesis. Well, I kind of took that and um, ran with it and was able to do stuff that became my thesis. So the techniques of my thesis enabled me to write a pretty short paper that um, verified the existence of the conjectured isogeny. And, and this article was in the Compte Rendu de l'Académie des Sciences in Paris. And it was uh, my first of two articles that I actually published in French. And um, the, the problem was that, uh, my article just kind of showed the existence of the isogeny, but it didn't actually kind of produce one. And, um, you know, the basic idea of the people who asked the original problems, Mumford, Kajdan, and so on, was that there should be some geometric machine that actually gives rise to this isogeny. And um, the Langlands correspondence in this case should have some geometric um, underpinning. And I felt um, inadequate that I hadn't actually found the isogeny that was conjectured. Um, but of course, as I've already said, faultings prove the general Tate conjecture. And so my techniques in, in my Concordi paper um, kind of just got completely washed away. But um, one thing that you can see is that these are olden times when it was quite common for articles to be published in French or German 
Now that seems to be increasingly rare. Um, so um, I, I kind of really started thinking very hard and it kept bugging me years and years into my career, use the word from the acronym of the uh, seminar. Um, and you know, I kind of wondered whether or not there was some geometric relation between the two types of curves and you can really ruminate about this question. So, you know, one curve, this is the classical modular curve, um, X zero PQ, now that's the one on the right. And on the left, you have the Shimura curve that classifies elliptic curves uh, of dimension two, abelian surfaces, sorry, that have an action of some maximal order of, uh, in a quaternion algebra of discriminant PQ. And, you know, you could say, well, there should be some correspondence. There should be some, uh, some curve in the product of these two curves, which expresses some uh, undisclosed uh, to be found relationship between elliptic curves with some extra level structure and abelian surfaces of the type that I described. And, and these are often called fake elliptic curves. Um, and, you know, it, it's not implausible when you first start thinking about it that you're going to see something like that. Uh, you know, think about the Herzberg Zagier cycles, which um, make a curve on some Hilbert uh, variety that classifies. Uh, Belian surfaces with real multiplication, where you impose some extra condition and you get abelian surfaces with this quaternionic multiplication. So I thought, you know, there must be something like that that is in play. But uh, nonetheless, I uh, was unable to discern any relationship between these objects. So I was still coming up short in this quest for actually finding some. Um, geometric underpinning to this uh, Langlands correspondence. So one thing that I, I must have said above, let me just check to see if this is true. Um, when I talked about the conjectured isogeny, I'm sorry if I'm making you nauseous by spinning through this um, really quickly, is that I talked about the new part of the Jacobian. And I, I wanna say now um, what that could be. So um, first of all, when you talk about the new part, um, what you need to do is you need to relate things of level PQ to things of level P and level Q. Those are the kind of old levels. And the point is that there are maps from X zero PQ to um, X zero of P. There are two such maps. And correspondingly, there are two such maps to X zero Q, these are called degeneracy maps. And they're very easy to describe geometrically. If you have an elliptic curve with a cyclic subgroup of order PQ, which is what the top curve classifies, you can either forget the, sub, the subgroup of order Q, think of PQ as being a product, or you can divide by it. And, and, and if you divide by the subgroup of order Q, you still get a subgroup of order P on the quotient. So um, th those are the two degeneracy maps. And then they induce maps between Jacobians of these curves. But of course, Jacobians are both Albanese and Picard varieties. They have the two different functorialities. So you get you know, from the two degeneracy maps, just for P, you get four maps between abelian varieties. You get two maps from J0 of P to J0 of PQ and two maps in the other direction. And so one thing you can do is you can take the um, collection of these maps going into J0 of PQ and you assemble them to give you a product. So you take the fourfold product of J0 P with itself and J0 Q with itself. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of old stuff. And that maps to J0 PQ, the image of that map uh, is the old subvariety 
of J0PQ, which by the way is isogenous to the fourfold product. And then you can talk about the new quotient, put the new as a superscript, and that's gotten by dividing the big abelian variety J0PQ by the old subvariety. But uh, using the other functoriality, you have a map from J0PQ to the fourfold product. The kernel of that map is uh, not necessarily connected. It's not connected, in fact, uh, unless P and Q are both very small, but um, up to finite groups, it's, it's connected. The connected component of it is an abelian subvariety of J0PQ, and that abelian subvariety is the new subvariety. So you have J0PQ new, which is a subvariety of J0PQ, and then that maps down to J0PQ upper new, which is the quotient. And you have uh, the composite of these two maps, which is an interesting isogeny. By definition, the kernel of that isogeny is the intersection of the old and new subvarieties of J0PQ. And, and just kind of following your nose, you can learn quite a bit about that. Um, but to really make the thing explicit, like you might say, what's the kernel of the isogeny exactly? Well, uh, it turns out you have to know the kernel of this map alpha, which is at the top of the screen. And figuring out the kernel of alpha is something that I got very interested in and that occupied me for quite a while. I probably um, say this on the next slide, so I won't doodle too much about this. Um, and But I also want to say, before I pass to the next slide, that if you uh, look at Barry Mazur's article, um, Rational Isogenies of Prime Degree, he raises explicitly this kind of question, what's the relationship between the new and the old? Uh, subvarieties of J0 of N, or um, what's the kernel of this natural isogeny from the new subvariety to the new quotient of J0 N, where N is an arbitrary integer. And um, this, this is a question that has not been fully resolved, although um, you might say that the answer is sufficiently messy that maybe it's not worth kind of going into this big bucket of nuts and bolts to figure out exactly what's going on. But um, th there is a lot of kind of geometric content in that kind of question, because you're, you're asking about uh, the relationship between, you're, you're asking about things that are simultaneously new and old, which is a very interesting subject that has to do with level raising and level lowering, which are uh, these things that I kind of really got into in, in the 1980s. Um, I guess now you can talk about level adjustment, which um, takes care of both of these concepts. So now, um, what am I doing on the slide? I guess I'm just um, rehashing what I already told you. Here is the isogeny between the new part as a subvariety and the new part as a quotient. And the kernel of this map, um, just by construction, is the intersection of the old and the new subvarieties. And, and I am actually wondering something, which is you'd like to know, like let's say you look at J0 PQ new, and you try to find some isogeny to this J0 PQ1, the Shimura thing. So this um, thing on the right is actually a Jacobian, which is to uh, tell you that it's auto dual. That's the main part that I wanted to say. Whereas this new thing is not auto dual, um, it's dual is J0 PQ upper new. And so when you look for an isogeny between something that's not dual, auto dual and something that is, you might be asking yourself, you know, what should you be doing? What should you be dividing by um, in order to uh, get a quotient 
that is auto dual. And um, what you can imagine is having some isogeny, call it lambda, such that when you take the dual of that isogeny, uh, lambda dual, and then compose it with lambda, you, uh, the dual of course is going from this self dual thing to the dual of the subvariety, which is the quotient. When you do the composite, you're gonna get a map from the new subvariety to the new quotient. And you should imagine that you're looking for a lambda such that this composition is exactly the isogeny that you knew about, the iota that's at the top of the page. And so um, what you really wanna do in some um, kind of heuristic sense is to find a, a square root, if you will, of the finite group that is the intersection of the new and the old subvarieties. You'd like to find something inside of this delta such that when you divide uh, J zero nu by the subgroup of delta, you get something that is um, self-dual. Um, and so uh, let, let me make my, my first of two um, chatty comments, um, which is that what I'm talking about in the previous slides is that um, I'm looking for a map from this new subvariety to the Shimura Jacobian, or um, alternatively, just by duality, a map from the Shimura Jacobian to the new subvariety. Um, this um, it, it seems natural that you should say, well, what you're really looking for is a map from J zero PQ to the Shimura uh, Jacobian, whose restriction to the new subvariety is the interesting thing. So you look for something like that. Or um, dually, you would imagine some map from the Shimura Jacobian to J zero PQ, such that um, when you compose with the quotient map, you get uh, the isogeny that you're looking for. Um, and, uh, you know, I was never able to find a map from J zero PQ to the, um, yeah, so what am I saying here? I was never able to find a map from J zero PQ to uh, this Shimura thing. Of course, if I did that, it would naturally uh, automatically be zero on the old subvariety. So it would be some map from the new quotient to the Shimura object. Um, that thing really just seems not to exist. So um, one thing that um, now throwing out as a chatty comment is that there might be some construction of a map between the new subvariety and the Shimura Jacobian or dually from the Shimura Jacobian to the new quotient without these maps extending or lifting um, depending on your perspective to maps from J zero PQ to uh, the Shimura thing or vice versa. So um, because th there just really seems to be no construction of the most um, naive thing, I was gonna say natural thing, let's say the most naive thing, um, maybe it's possible that by looking for something less, you're actually able to um, get information that was previously um, undiscovered. Okay, so um, here's a, a slide that uh, just kind of says in, in printed words, something that I've already kind of mentioned a couple of times, which is that by doing some diagram chasing, which I, I certainly don't wanna to try to do now, um, you can identify this quotient 
uh, uh, sorry, this quotient, this, this intersection between the new and the old subvarieties, if you are able to, um, first of all, figure out what the composite of these two degeneracy maps is, and that's very easy. So here you have a fourfold product mapping into J0 PQ, which maps to um, the fourfold product. Um, this composition would naturally be described as a four by four matrix of homomorphisms. And you know half of them are um, just zero. There are no non-zero maps between J0P and J0Q or vice versa. And for example, the maps from J0P to J0P are, are just some degrees of the degeneracy maps, which are Q plus one. And um, believe it or not, the Qth Hecke operator, which can be defined as a composition of these two degeneracy maps. So, so you really know what this composite is and you can um, write down uh, the four by four matrix in terms of two by two matrices. Um, one kind of thing for J0Q would be this matrix here, which um, when you kind of diagonalize it, um, it gives you T plus one plus P plus one and T Cp rather minus p minus one. These are um, the sort of objects that appear when you think about level raising going from level p to level q. Um, that's how I got into the study of level raising. It's because I was looking at these composites. Um, if you want to start simply, instead of taking a fourfold product, you take the twofold two product, you raise from level Q to level PQ or level P to level PQ. So that I kind of understood. And then you have to understand also the kernel of this map, which um, has a finite kernel. And how do you see the kernel of that map? Well, if you take the kernel of, um, of a simpler map, this is the thing that I discovered in 1983, it's, it's the Shimura subgroup of uh, J0 of P embedded anti-diagonally in J0 of P. Similarly for J0 Q, these are kind of Eisenstein things that um, maybe should be just ignored at first glance. You could say, well, basically this is just an embedding of the twofold product in uh, J0 PQ. And then you say, well, how about the fourfold product? You have to understand um, what happens inside of J0PQ, the stuff from level P and the stuff from level Q, do they interact at all? Well, then you get into the question of whether there are interesting uh, finite flat group schemes inside J0PQ that are really finite flat over spec Z. Namely, are, are there things that are just flat completely finite and flat at every prime, um, having good reduction at P and good reduction at Q. And it, it's not at all obvious that there aren't these things. And, and this is the question of level lowering. Um, and it turns out this was, you know, Sarah's epsilon conjecture and so on, that um, indeed there is no interaction between level P and level Q. So um, basically, um, aside from some cuspidal stuff and some Shimura subgroup stuff, these are just buzzwords for things that um, uh, that interact with uh, reducible representations of Galois and can be neglected at first blush. Basically, the whole um, the whole fourfold product just kind of injects into J zero of PQ. So when you look at this delta you are going to be um, looking at um, the kernel of some matrix on a fourfold product, which is easy to understand. And um, it's inside Delta that you're trying to find an interesting subject group to divide by in order to get the sought after isogeny. Well, I hope that made sense um, more or less. So um, here on this slide, is basically a, a written 
summary of what I just said in some slightly incoherent way. And um, I won't dwell on this any further, um, except just to say, this is something I've, I've already um, asked about uh, in, in what I was writing with my stylus before, um, what you um, really might want to do is think about, you know, what you should divide the new subvariety by in order to get something isomorphic to the Shimura Jacobian. Well, um, you have to look inside of this intersection delta, which is a completely explicit group, and you have to imagine something that has um, the um, good symmetry properties. Um, at, at some point, and now I think I wanna mention Andrew Ogg's name because there is some surmise in the subject that uh, is called Ogg's conjecture and um, turns out not to be correct for reasons that I'll explain, but um, was it very important in guiding people initially. And, and what is Ogg's conjecture about? Well, Ogg's conjecture was, well, you know, let's look at, um, look for a map from J0 PQ to this uh, Shimura Jacobian. Of course, you expect it, uh, it, it will necessarily factor through the new quotient. And then the question is, what do you have to divide by in order to get the target on the right-hand part of the diagram. Well, um, inside of J0PQ, there's a finite group, which is called the cuspidal subgroup. And on X0PQ, there are four cusps. Um, the cuspidal subgroup uh, consists of points that are represented by divisors that are uh, supported on the set with four elements. So it's, it doesn't sound like a um, very complicated group, but actually if you try to write down what the C is um, in this case, it, it turns out to be um, fairly interesting. And there are um, factors in the order like P minus one, Q minus one, P minus one, Q plus one, and um, Q plus, I don't know, uh, P plus one, Q minus one. There's a paper by Og in uh, the bulletin, I think, of the French Mathematical Society from the 1970s, where he kind of explains what this group is and calculates its order up to powers of two. And what Og said is that in the Shimura um, world, there are no cusps. So um, what you expect is that if you take the image of the cuspidal subgroup in this new quotient, the cusps should all map to zero because there or aren't gonna be any distinguished rational points on the Shimura Jacobian. And um, in fact, just a, a slight digression, uh, I can, whoops, I just dropped my slot stylus. I'm so excited. Um, I can mention the work of Hua Zhang Yu, who um, has shown under um, you know, pretty mild hypotheses that there are no rational torsion points on these Shimura Jacobians. <clears throat> That's kind of the opposite of uh, J0PQ where the cusps generate rational torsion points. And in fact, there's a, a conjecture of William Stein that's almost completely proved to the effect that um, the rational torsion points on uh, J0 of N, where N is say square free, um, all come from the cuspidal group. So there was this conjecture of Og that you could get uh, the Shimura Jacobian from the new quotient of J0 PQ just by dividing by the cusps. And, and that seems not to be correct. In fact, um, there are explicit examples where it doesn't look so good. Um, and I will tell you some of the literature um, as I turn to subsequent slides. So here is the, um, some relevant literature. 
Um, Bruce Jordan wrote to me this morning, and I hope he's uh, listening to this talk. He said he would come. Um, Bruce uh, did a lot of pioneering work on the arithmetic of these Shimura curves and their Jacobians over Q. And then he teamed up with Bruce, uh, with Ron Livney, and the two of them wrote a number of interesting articles on uh, the good and bad reduction of Shimura curves and rational points of the Jacobians. And David Helm, who was, uh, wrote a thesis under my direction <coughs> some years ago, wrote an article in the Israeli uh, Journal of Israel Journal of Mathematics, where um, he pursues an idea that's really due to Barry Mazur, which is the following sort of idea. Well, you know, maybe the Shimura Jacobian and the regular Jacobian are um, not related by a canonical isogeny, but the thing that you might want to do um, is to um, look at the group of homomorphisms from one abelian variety to the other. And think of this as a HECA module, meaning a module over the ring of HECA operators that's acting say on J0 PQ and, and try to find the isomorphism class of this module. Um, when, for example, is it locally free? When meaning it, uh, after completing it, which maximal ideals? So, so that idea uh, was pursued by Helm's paper. And, and by the way, if you um, happen to have a copy of these slides, which you can get by emailing me, um, the, the red text uh, consists of links. So if you were to click on the title of the first paper, you would get a web page um, where the paper is presented and you can download that paper. And um, maybe more importantly, more recently anyway, um, Kwasin and Papikin have written articles looking at homomorphisms between the two types of abelian varieties and trying to figure out exactly what happens and um, seeing whether Ogg's conjecture can be verified in some circumstances or whether there are counterexamples in some circumstances. Um, and I think both of these uh, second, these last papers are in the proceedings of the American Math Society. So um, now I wanna um, bring up uh, the kind of next to last subject, which is uh, related to an article that I wrote in a volume of papers dedicated to Ilya Piotrowski Shapiro, where I talk about multiplicity one. So what do I mean by multiplicity one? Well, take a maximal ideal of the ring of Hecke operators on J zero P and take the kernel of that maximal ideal. Well, kind of randomly, unless you know M is very special, there's a two dimensional Gawa representation attached to M where you know, the traces of Frobenius or Hecke operators mod M and the determinant is the mod L cyclotomic character where M divides L. Um, there's always a representation like this, um, two dimensional, continuous, um, semi-simple, but under most circumstances, generically, this thing is irreducible. Um, that's the non-Eisenstein case, which as I said before, should be the case that you really focus on um, if you wanna look at this um, you know, for the first time. And um, if you take the kernel of multiplication by M on this Jacobian, um, Mazur proved that it's a successive extension of copies of this two-dimensional representation that's at the top of the screen. And actually I have some paper with uh, Hendrik Lenstra and Nigel Boston, um, where we prove that the extension splits, at least if the residue characteristic is bigger than two. So you, you can think that this is, you know, kind of lots of copies, some number of copies 
of this two-dimensional representation. But usually, um, under very mild hypotheses, um, this thing is actually two-dimensional and there's only one copy. So the fact that it's one copy is called multiplicity one. And um, Maser proved the multiplicity one theorem for prime level in his Eisenstein ideal paper that was published around 1977. And in my article where I do level lowering in 1990, I, I just show that Maser's technique works much more broadly. So, you know, kind of basically at first blush, you should think that multiplicity one holds for um, the uh, Jacobians of ordinary modular curves. However, if you um, look at the Shimura curves, you get a different um, perspective, something else happens and the multiplicity can be bigger than one. People have studied this um, after my work and, and given shown that the multiplicity is either one or two and they've given necessary and sufficient conditions for the multiplicity to be two rather than one. And the main condition is where um, this representation, which um, has every right to be ramified both at P and at Q, um, happens to be unramified at one of these two primes. So think of P and Q and the residue characteristic as being three different primes. Um, you can ask, you know, does it happen that um, the um, representation is unramified at P even though it's allowed to be ramified at P? Well, the answer is it does. And, and this is um, Serre's epsilon conjecture, level lowering, it happens exactly when the representation arises from lower level, from level Q. And when it's unramified at P, there's a Frobenius at P that's operating. And, um, you know, its eigenvalues are constrained by the level lowering condition because the thing is simultaneously looking like it's multiplicative, but really of good reduction. But um, one really special case that can occur is if Frobenius operates as a scalar matrix, which is then going to be plus one or minus one. And, and that's the condition to have multiplicity bigger than one. And it can happen. So you, you take, um, you can take a representation of level Q and um, look for uh, primes P by the Chevtorov density theorem, whose Frobenius is plus one or minus one in this representation. Well, there's an infinite number of them. And you take that P and then you raise the level to PQ, which you can do because the condition is satisfied. And you get something that um, appears in the Shimura Jacobian, but it appears with multiplicity bigger than one. And um, if this is true, then you kind of imagine what's going on here if you have an isogeny between the new subvariety which will inherit the multiplicity one problem and the Shimura thing, which doesn't have the multiplicity one uh, property in order to have an isogeny that um, is compatible with that, um, you had um, better be dividing by something that involves uh, these representations where the Frobenius is plus one and minus one. Just a second. Okay, I've turned on the light. Um, and so what can you do? Well, I have a chatty comment, which is that you might wanna look at the group of points in this intersection that are unramified at P. Um, what does that mean? It means that uh, the points in all their Galois conjugates, if you like, are unramified at P, or they're unramified at, in, for all decomposition groups at P. And um, look at the points that are not only unramified, but where Frobenius is acting as plus one or minus one for all decomposition groups. This makes up a sub-representation that's compatible, that's uh, stable under Galois and Hecke. And, and this is the kind of group that you need to divide by in my um, humble guess, 
in order to make the sort of isogeny that we're looking for. So there are really four choices. Are you choosing P or are you choosing Q? Are you choosing plus one and minus one? Maybe take the sum of all these things and you might have some interesting candidate um, for a group that you could divide by and hope that you get something like the Shimura Jacobian. So that's my, my chatty comment. And now I'm almost out of time, but I really want to say that um, I kept on this problem over and over again. And I thought to myself, well, you know, suppose there was a map between J0 of PQ and the Shimura thing. Well, you can um, take this map and see what it induces on uh, narrow models. Uh, pass to characteristic P or characteristic Q. Um, look at what happens when you restrict to the toric parts of these their own models. Um, that's a good thing to look at because the Shimura Jacobian has totally multiplicative reduction at P and at Q. So you're not losing very much if you look at these tori. And um, if you have a map between the original abelian varieties, you have a map between the tori, this gives you a map between the character groups. So I said to myself, well, if there's an isogeny, if there's a homomorphism from one abelian variety to another, there's gonna be a map between the character groups. Let's figure out what that map is. So I looked at these character groups and um, of course there's this remarkable change of invariance that's due to um, Cherednik and Drinfeld, where you look at um, J0 of PQ and say characteristic P, well, by Deline Rappaport, you're looking at super singular elliptic curves and characteristic P with some level Q structure. You're looking at the definite quaternion algebra over Q with discriminant P. And um, when you uh, do the corresponding thing on the Shimura side, that's where Cherednik and Drinfeld come in instead of getting the quaternion algebra of discriminant P, you get the quaternion algebra of discriminant Q. And so I said to myself, well, how can this poss be possible to have um, some relation between objects for these two different quaternion algebras? Um, well, maybe it's possible. Maybe you do some tensor product with the quaternion algebra of discriminant PQ. So I thought about this for a long time and I, um, made an, a, a, a precise exact sequence that um, relates the uh, character group for the Shimura Jacobian in characteristic P to character groups for two different um, classical Jacobians in characteristic Q. Um, so that seemed really weird to me. How could this be possible? And I kept this exact sequence around um, in my mind for a very long time and um, couldn't see how to use it to um, recreate, to back out this isogeny, but it was really the, the motivator for my looking at that exact sequence. And, and now um, to close, um, so I say this seems really bad. My, my last slide is kind of the fact that um, when I um, had this exact sequence as something that I kept thinking about. It turned out that this exact sequence was exactly the kind of missing ingredient that I needed to prove um, Serres epsilon conjecture in 1986, whenever that was, um, showing that you could do level lowering. Um, the argument was some long argument by contradiction, and it somehow compared what you knew about these two characteristics in some infinite circle where you finally got some contradiction. So that was kind of um, very useful. And I remember that after I um, proved my result, I tried to make the relationship between the two character groups um, as precise as possible. So, you know, one character group I called Y and it's in characteristic P and there's another characteristic group I, uh, character group I called L for lattice. It's in characteristic Q. And there's a canonical map 
between these, um, if you take canonical with the right um, grain of salt, um, the canonicity um, has to do with the following thing, that when you do say super singular elliptic curves in characteristic P, you're looking at objects over FP squared. And similarly, for these uh, fake elliptic curves, you're looking for objects over FQ squared. And in order to make an actual um, relationship between characteristic P and characteristic Q objects, you have to do the following thing. So there is an order of discriminant PQ, the maximal order that is used to define the Shimura curve. You take abelian surfaces with an action of um, this particular um, order. And this order has a residue field that's isomorphic that has order P squared and another residue field that has size Q squared. And you have to take those fields to be um, the fields over which you consider your objects and then they can be um, precisely identified. And I'll, I'll close um, with one anecdote, which is that when I discovered this, I was asked to give a, uh, a lecture at UCLA and it was in a lecture room with a very, very long chalkboard. So the chalkboard was like this, you know, and I was at the front of the room. And I went to the chalkboard and I began my talk in this little corner and I talked about characteristic P. And then I kind of walked over and I went to the other corner and I talked about characteristic Q. And I turned around to the audience, I thought this was really great theater. And I said that these are actually the same thing. And, and that was my theorem, that the two corners of the board were actually, um, could be identified. So I made some a big chalk mark between the two. And uh, I guess you don't think it's all that funny. But anyway, that's, uh, that, that, that's one of my more mem memorable talks actually in Los Angeles when I spoke at UCLA. Okay. Thank you, Ken. So let's uh, thank Ken, Ken for the talk. Well, thank you all for listening. You can use the reaction on the, yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, guys. So thanks for giving this, this first talk of the series. Any questions for Ken? I think, the, uh, Ken, your slides are going to be available, right? For Yeah, I'll be happy to send you the slides. Mm -hmm. And then um, you can distribute them. Or if people write directly to me, I'll send them the slides as well. It'll be on the seminar web page, I think. Yeah, yeah so that's any the questions? best thing. Uh, any questions? For... Uh, I have a question. So it's, it's just a historical question. Um, of course, faulting proved, faulting's proved the take conjecture for, I guess, endomorphisms of villain varieties. And I didn't realize, but you mentioned that Sayer had proved the same thing for elliptic curves, for isogenies between elliptic curves, um, when both or one has uh, uh, bad reduction at some place. And then you said that that hypothesis could be removed and or was removed before Faulting's theorem. Um, do you have a no, reference? No, I, 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 did, I didn't say that. I said that. Um, I see, I misunderstood, I see. Yeah, I, I probably misspoke. So um, there was this thing called the isogeny conjecture and uh, Sarah proved the isogeny conjecture for um, elliptic curves, one of which um, has uh, potential multiplicative reduction at at least one place. Of course, the hypothesis in the isogeny conjecture is that the abelian elliptic representations, the, the elliptic representations for the two elliptic curves are isomorphic, so you can detect the bad reduction. If one has bad reduction, so does the other. Um, and um, he he did prove that uh, that isogeny conjecture only under that hypothesis. But then, um, in in his book, he kind of looked at you know the images of Galois representations, and using the transvections coming from multiplicative reduction, he could fill them out much more easily than um, if that hypothesis was absent. And in his 1972 paper, he um, kind of jettisoned the hypothesis to fill out the Galois representations. But it's I absolutely see, true, absolutely true that it was not known until faultings that two elliptic curves with say integral J invariants um, were isogenous 
if uh, they had isomorphic Galois representations. I see. So the, the removal of hypothesis was in the large image theorem, not right. As exactly. Vector business. I understand. Right. Yeah. yeah I, I, it's in his abelian analytic representations book. Um, I guess I can put it in chat where it is. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Ken? So I have a question, can do you ex in the end, then do you expect there's a, there is some isogeny and somebody's going to write down at some point? Or... Oh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, I've, I've certainly asked um, many people to do it. And, and you know, a after trying, trying myself and other people trying and David Helm's thesis, um, there was this sort of meta conclusion that no, no isogeny is going to be written down. Um, but that doesn't mean that we haven't missed something, especially if you don't insist on a map from the full classical Jacobian to the Shimura Jacobian, but you just want a map from the new subvariety. I ask if you try to, if you try to think about writing down the correspondence between the two curves. Um, well, that's how I started. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just wondering, I, can you give, um, so I guess you're going to view it as a, as a map from one curve to the sim n of the other curve. And you could ask how big n, n has to be. Um, do you have any, I mean, are there lower bounds? Like, does n have to be at least like, at least PQ or something like that? Or Oh my God. So, so this is a great question that I'd never thought of before. And, and I, I don't know the answer. And, and thank you for asking it. Do, do the people know what, what, have people written down these things for very small values of P and Q? Oh, sure. Um, so there, there, there's, there's literature when uh, the Shimura curve is, a, um, is an elliptic curve and, and then you can compare it um, precisely mm -hmm. with other elliptic curves you know and you see what the kernel is. Um, and, and then there are these papers that, that I had listed by Kwasin and Papikin where they looked at other examples. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I guess there's no pattern, <laughs> no obvious pattern. No obvious pattern, I think is right. I, I guess I may have missed this, but <clears throat> have people worked out what the degree or have people worked out a guess for what the degree must be? Uh, I don't know anything about the degree. I think if you could do the degree, you could probably um, yeah, I, I don't think there's a there's a general guess for what the minimal degree is. I mean, certainly in, in these articles that I mentioned, they they, they make explicitly the isogeny of smallest degree. Yeah, you, you can get terrible bounds from all things that from others about on, on the minimal degree, but um, right. I didn't know if you went to uh, computer integrally, I guess, to guess what the degree must be. I don't know. Any? Other questions or I think Ken is going to hang around for a little bit uh, after the talk so we could maybe shift to that uh, sort of setting and uh, thank Ken again for a, a brilliant start to the to the series thanks okay Th th thank you again for listening